As you said, he believes that the CIA was involved in the death, in the murder of his uncle. He also be does not believe that Sirhan Sirhan was the assassin of his father. Um, that, that was something that he talked about in an interview with Bill Maher recently. So he does have, as you said, this attention to the truth and not to the sort of blind ideology that captivates both parties. Well, listen, what is it about RFK Jr.? I, I, I find myself, uh, in a way, cheering him on because anybody who's a truth teller on anything, I could disagree with you violently on you know X, Y, and Z, but if you're telling the truth about vaccine harms or if you're telling the truth about any of this stuff, I'm just thrilled because so many people are uh, too cowardly to talk about what's in front of them. Or, or uh, so, w what is the, what is the deal with RFK Jr. in the sense that where did he come from? What's he been doing? And how does he suddenly find himself uh, the, at the center of attention? Very, very controversial. Very hated by many Democrats because uh, I don't know <laughs> because he's stealing the thunder of. Joe Biden, who, who has no thunder to steal. So I'm not sure what the big deal is. Of course. Well, RFK Jr. has been of interest for me and for my colleagues at the American Conservative for some time now since his announcement. Um, and that's not just because of the excitement that he stirred up among others on the political right, um, but because the last time that a major presidential candidate challenged the incumbent within his own party was the campaign of Pat Buchanan in the 1992 Republican primary. Pat Buchanan, of course, was one of the founders of our magazine back in 2002. Another point of interest um, is that our magazine has always been about going against the reigning orthodoxies of the time, especially within the GOP, whether those orthodoxies pertain to challenging the military industrial complex, the sort of feverish interventionism that characterized the Bush era, um, or the sort of fundamentalism with trade and immigration. Kennedy seems to be doing the same thing within his own party, both in tone and in principle. Uh, finally, and most plainly, uh, he's a Kennedy. Those within his own party- I, I actually forgot about that. I'm not kidding. You're right. I'm, I'm actually not kidding. Like it's the kind of thing that you kind of, it's already baked in, you take it for granted, but you think somebody needs to say that. Thank you, Harry Shearer, for saying that. He's a Kennedy. For the love of Pete, he's the son of uh, the murdered uh, RFK Sr. Uh, he's the nephew of President JFK. I mean, it's, it is a big deal when a Kennedy steps in to the Democratic uh, political debate. It's a huge thing, and I think it's because of that, and I don't mean to steal your thunder, but it seems that is why uh, the Democratic establishment is so angry because he's not just some guy. He is, you know, a Kennedy. Absolutely. I mean, his uncle was the king of Camelot. His father, you said, as you said, um, was just about to clinch the Democratic nomination when he was assassinated in 1968. And now the Biden administration is making a point of rejecting the Secret Service protections that he's been requesting for months now, even with all this history. It just so happens that he's running against uh, the geriatric patient, right? And he's running a campaign that is fundamentally opposed to many of his own party's principles. Well, it is bizarre, really, that, it, where, where does he come from? Let, 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 let's go there. In other words, where, where does he, how does he suddenly uh, come to be known? I mean, I've known him as somebody who's spoken out against vaccines for years, but where did he come from? What's he been doing uh, up until now, roughly speaking? He's been doing a lot of environmental activism um, and environmental law with Riverkeeper and Waterkeeper. So these are two groups that were environmental law groups. So he, one of his, one of his biggest achievements, he was, um, he was recognized in Time Magazine in the late 90s for his work cleaning up the Hudson River. So one of the things that really shined through during our interview um, and within, with his personal history is how much of a litig litigator he is. Of course, President Trump uh, is so used to the one being sued, right? And that's, and that's one of the things that people know him for. But then RFK Jr. has that sort of uh, litigatory zeal where he's always ready to go out and, and try cases. 
And so, but he's also a believer in free market capitalism. I mean, that's not typical for Democrats these days. That's right. So he, he is libertarian in a good number of issues, um, especially in, in economic issues, and he even ties that to his environmental concerns. The civil liberta libertarianism, though, is something that has been a little bit more confusing in recent days. Of course, we all saw the reporting that came out on Sunday evening in which he had an interview with an NBC reporter, and it seemed that his position on, on abortion was confused. He, he brought up the idea of a 12-week ban or a three-month ban. This was not, his, his, the reporter did not ask him about any time-based restrictions, but this was something that he brought up on his own. And then his campaign, um, sadly for, for the pro-life movement, of course, um, drew that back and said that he fully supports a woman's right to choose. So it, wait, it's wait, interesting. Wait, wait. I, fully I don't know. supports a woman's right to kill her child up until the ninth right. month. That's... That's the bombshell horror. That's the nightmare. Because here's a man uh, with whom I would agree on many things, um, certainly not on everything, and I would expect him to be vaguely pro-choice. Like, why would we expect any different? But for him, uh, for his campaign to come out and to say that he favors abortion into ninth month, now that seems to me to be nakedly political. In other words, the, the fact is that he believes he has a chance in the Democratic Party and that his campaign said, unless you put that issue aside so that every Democrat knows that you're, you're with them on that issue, uh, you don't have a chance. So it seems to me to be nakedly political and to belie probably what I think his conscience actually tells him. I would agree with you. We don't know what, what sort of combined interests led to that statement that came out just speculating, but there could be members of his campaign that they're they're working for a Democrat, right? And they say that we won't work for you unless you come out and support a woman's right to choose. His donors, the party itself, I mean, it, it's it's become clear that he's not too concerned about what the priorities of his party are, but you never know uh, to what extent that, that might yeah, have contributed. Well, it's really, it's really sad that that, that came out. But I, I want to be clear for my audience, uh, because there are a lot of people that are so hidebound that unless you tick off every box and agree with them on everything, you're out. I think that's ridiculous. I think we ought to remember that Rudolph Giuliani ran uh, and became the mayor of New York City, thank God, and basically saved this city from utter ruin and brought it into a, a golden era. And I live here, so I know what I'm talking about. And because of the makeup of this city politically, he had to be pro-choice and pro-gay rights or whatever it was that I disagree with. But you, you're dealing with politics, so it's, it is a little complicated. And some people will brook zero dissent on certain of these issues. And I think that anybody who would expect that somebody running on the Democratic side that would have any kind of pro-life position is just preposterous. And so what I want to do is I want to I thank God for where he is speaking the truth. And this is no different than if you're hearing from Bill Maher or Russell Brand or anybody who uh, is not a conservative, who, who's not a Christian, but they're speaking truth, Naomi Wolf, uh, on really, really important things. I think we need to understand that that's tremendously helpful in general. And so uh, it bothers me profoundly that, that his campaign said that, but at the same time, I kind of want to put that in a box and talk about what he is saying that is so disturbing to the Democratic establishment. So, so in your article, um, you talk about some of that. Uh, why do you think suddenly he decides he wants to run for president? What, 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 where, what led him to that? That's really the shocker. I think COVID was a very formative thing for him specifically. And he received a lot of pushback, specifically on social media. It's become clear that the Biden administration was colluding with Facebook to get his Instagram removed. So we have one of the clearest violation of political rights just in that example. So I think he's he's received uh, a lot of momentum from that encounter. So as, as you said, I, I agree with you on the issue of not being able to tick a box for every single issue. Not every candidate, there's not gonna be a single candidate that a voter will agree with on every single issue, right? But it's these political rights that he is very concerned with. The, the, the social issues are something that in the interview, it, it became clear he was not as concerned with. He didn't, he, he has, 
deeply, deeply held beliefs, that's for sure. But it was just clear just with the way that he was communicating it that it's not, it's not the height of his priority. Where else uh, would we who are America first conservatives uh, where else would we agree with RFK Jr.? Is the, I guess free speech is a gigantic issue. In other words, you just referenced Biden and company trying to censor. I mean, this is so despicable. It's mind-bending to me that we're here in America, that the left is against free speech. I don't, I don't even know how you can be against free speech and be even vaguely American. Like, it's just the most extraordinary thing that we've come to this place, that the left is really in lockstep with Marxist ideology, absolutely anti-liberty, anti-founders vision. So RFK Jr. on that issue seems to me uh, to be a real American. He certainly has priorities that are aligned with the right. It's not just, I, I do not believe it's just a social media phenomenon that people on the right are attracted to him. The issues of poli the political rights, social media tyranny, um, and misinformation, the, the sort of obsession with misinformation on the left, right? Um, the, the, government, the government surveillance as well, these are all things that mainstream Republicans are certainly concerned with, and RFK is as well. But then also, as I mentioned in my piece, issues that, that the so-called dissident right is concerned with about clean air and clean water, so-called um, crunchy, more crunchy conservatives, um, and things of that nature, RFK is certainly interested in. Well, I mean, I guess the, the, the point that has to be made is that we have all, uh, th those of us on the conservative side, have increasingly dismissed so-called environmentalism because it's been given over to complete loons. I mean, they, they are no longer, unless you agree with them on climate change, uh, unless you agree with them on kind of this, it's a, it's a Malthusian, anti-human, you know, uh, wipe out as many human beings as we can to save the planet. It's, it's this kind of a bizarre new age religion. And we have really over, the, over time, more and more, those of us on the right, uh, just stepped away because we don't, we haven't seen any voices of reasonable uh, environmentalism. We, we, and so RFK Jr. is certainly that. I agree. During, during the interview, it was very clear that he is not bought and sold in this sort of climatist ideology. It's not something that, that he agrees with. As you mentioned at the beginning, he ties the notion of free market capitalism to his environmental concerns. So it, every, everything, he's a very, he's a very thoughtful man. That, that's a, a typical depiction and description of him. And it's certainly shown through uh, during my interview with him. And so I don't think that you'll find many positions that RFK Jr. will take on for which he is totally ideological. Um, I think sort of local government liberals are very interested in him because he has this tone and attitude about him that citizens and different organizations can approach him with their positions on issues and he would hear them out. I, I think Biden, he, he framed his candidacy as like the unifying president, the president for all Americans. But at least for me, it's slightly more compelling for RFK Jr. because he, he is really a, a true liberal by temperament. So he takes it seriously. Well, yeah, I mean, he seems a liberal in the, in the vein of, of his uncle, JFK Jr., who now would be considered roughly conservative on many things. That's what's so bizarre is the way the parties have changed. Um, uh, l let's talk about big pharma. I mean, there is nothing more horrifying to me than to see uh, multi-billion dollar companies crushing free speech, crushing dissent, allying themselves with the democratic establishment and with what used to be the journalistic establishment in America to crush free speech, to crush the search for truth. It's, it's, it's really a mind-blowing development that we're here. And RFK Jr. has stood against that rather bravely. So talk about uh, what he has to say uh, about big pharma and vaccines. Absolutely, he calls it the medical cartel. He said in a recent interview that within the first 100 days of his administration, he would tra we'd travel to Bethesda, which is the headquarters for the some of these agencies within HHS. Um, and so 
he is very interested in curbing the corrupt merger, as he calls it, between state and corporate power that exists with the so-called medical cartel, this uh, collusion between the big pharmaceutical companies and the federal agencies that are supposed to regulate them. We touched on vaccines briefly during our interview. It wasn't something that I wanted to make a big issue because, of course, the mainstream media is making vaccines the issue of his campaign. The New York Times can't help themselves every time they mention him. They have to call him a someone who spreads misinformation on vaccines. It, it's like Purdue Pharma and all the other pharmaceutical companies get $100 million every time the New York Times mentions that, right? But he does say for those Americans who are skeptical or concerned about the vaccine regime that 95, 99% of Americans would agree with this position on vaccines, which is that the data should be available to Americans and there should be informed consent. That's that's really seems to be his position on it. And, uh, but he also said that he would release that data that he says the CDC has, but that Americans don't have access to. There's so many things to praise about RFK Jr. Uh, and it's it's just fascinating that that he's thrown his hat into the ring, as we often say. But he he really is um, a truth teller. He's brave. He doesn't care that the New York Times calls him an anti-vaxer or whatever. He really uh, he he is heroic in his willingness uh, to go against um, you know those who who would prefer that he would shut up and just get on uh, Team Biden. Um, what does he say about, well, actually, let me, let me bring up the, the, the biggest thing that he said. He believes, as do I, and I've had many guests on this program to corroborate it, that the CIA uh, was directly involved in the murder of President John F. Kennedy, his uncle. That is something that has been, you know, brooded about in various circles over the decades. But for someone running for president to say that about his own uncle and about the CIA, which is funded by our tax dollars. That is bombshell news. Uh, can you say more about that? Absolutely. There is a lot of myth and legend around his candidacy. Again, this is why I find it so surprising that his, his people within his own party who are trying to squash his campaign are saying that he doesn't have a shot because it, it excites the imagination and the mind in ways that other campaigns simply don't. So as you said, he believes that the CIA was involved in the death, in the murder of his uncle. He also be does not believe that Sirhan Sirhan was the assassin of his father. Um, that, that was something that he talked about in an interview with Bill Maher recently. So he does have, as you said, this attention to the truth and not to the sort of blind ideology that captivates both parties. Well, and listen, the, the fact is that it is almost certainly true, if you, if you pay any attention to the facts, that the CIA was involved in the murder of President Kennedy. That is as evil and sick as anything that's ever happened in this nation. And the fact that it's been swept under the rug, the fact that we have rogue uh, bureaucracy, that we have the CIA uh, and the FBI uh, really not working for we the people, but kind of doing their own thing. And what's interesting to me is that we're seeing it uh, in a way that we haven't seen since the Kennedy assassination. In other words, Kennedy uh, in his day was going against what we now call the deep state. He was ruffling feathers. He was scaring people because the, 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 the corruption was so deep. Uh, if you know about, you know, uh, President Johnson, who was as corrupt a bum almost as uh, as as Biden, um, you know about uh, J. Edgar Hoover. When you when you know the depth of the corruption back then, uh, sixty years ago, astonishingly, but it's been kind of swept under the rug, and then suddenly it's coming up again. We are seeing this thing called the deep state. We're now aware of its existence. But it seems to me that his uncle was aware of its existence. It would have been called the military industrial complex. We were warned by Eisenhower. So it's interesting to me that this figure arises now, who's the nephew of uh, this assassinated president, the son of this assassinated candidate. Um, so there is something mythical about this, that, that we are, in a, in a sense, revisiting uh, that time in our own time. 
Absolutely. As you said, Eisenhower coined that phrase rather prophetically in his farewell address right before JFK took office. And RFK Jr. told me that his uncle JFK realized that Eisenhower knew what he was talking about within the first few months. The corrupt merger between the big five, what have now become the big five arms dealers and the agencies under the executive branch, such as state, defense, and energy. Those are, those are the, mo the, the biggest offenders. And it's something that, that RFK is very, is very much formed by. And one of the other appeals of his campaign that I think people, people recognized, perhaps subconsciously, is that he does not talk about these issues as something that he read about in a history course, but it's something that he lived. He saw his uncle meet with, um, uh, he saw his father, rather, meet with a Russian spy in their own home. He saw his uncle pick up the red phone that would direct him uh, directly to the Kremlin. So this sort of diplomacy in history is something that he knows rather instinctively because he saw it. I think that there are many, many, many uh, on the Democratic side who really do see him uh, as, a, as a savior of the party. And that's what horrifies uh, the establishment uh, in the Democratic Party. But it's interesting because it's, it's the same with Trump. Uh, we now finally know um, the depth of the horror and the corruption. Uh, we now know, you guys at the American Conservative know, the horror of the neocons, that Bush and Cheney were not our friends. We uh, many times naively went along with them, but we now see, because of Donald Trump, the disruptor, that no, they were, uh, they were lining their pockets or they were at least uh, protecting their own power. They really did not have the concerns of we the people front and center. They were part of something that we now recognize, the Uniparty, the deep state. And so we're, we're seeing a revolution uh, happening in our time. And, and that's, to my mind, what makes RFK Jr. so exciting, because you think that, well, we'll just see it on our side with Trump. But no, we're seeing it on the, on the left as well. Some people, uh, I think I even at one point mentioned RFK would be a great, you know, vice presidential candidate for, for Donald Trump. Um, I, I don't think that's true, but I think it's interesting that things are being, uh, in a sense, broken up. The standard view of things is, is being broken up. We've just got 30 seconds left. Final comment uh, on, your, uh, on your article, your take on RFK Jr. Yes, well, as, as you mentioned, the, the political landscape has changed so much in the past few years. Douglas McGregor, who was in the Trump administration doing foreign policy work for them, he told me that, that Trump and Kennedy would make a really powerful ticket. So whether, whether that's true or not, or to the extent with which you agree with it, it, it just indicates that a man who was regularly on Tucker Carlson to talk about foreign intervention and who was in the Trump administration is saying that a Democrat would make a powerful Un ticket with Donald unbelievable. Trump. Unbelievable. Folks, check out the AmericanConservative.com. Harry Shearer, thank you.